Well, my name's Ken. My call sign's M1SLH. And SLH was my grandfather's initials. And it was he who aroused my interest in radio from a, from a very young age. After um, dismantling and re-engineering a variety of domestic wireless equipment, I undertook an apprenticeship with Decca Radar and, uh, in, the, in the 1960s, which gave me a very good grounding in electronics and RF techniques. However, I then became fascinated by the bright flashing lights of the computer industry and got a job as a customer engineer, working mainly on hardware uh, mainframe hardware at large installations throughout the south of England. It was in 1982 that I joined Cray Research, just as Cray One was uh, being superseded by the Cray XMP. So in this talk, I will outline the history of the Cray One and how it fits into the history of scientific computing from the very dawn of the electronic computer age. I do not propose to go into computer science, but um, uh, unavoidable jargon will pop up and I, I'll make sure it's understandable to all. So, oh, let me see if I can get down to the next slide here. Okay, so the Cray-1 supercomputer was the brainchild of computer engineer Seymour Cray. And the first product of his uh, company Cray Research founded just over 50 years ago in 1972. The first working model left the factory gates in 1976, but the lead up to that occasion began much earlier in the dark, desperate days of World War II. We'll see that the Cray-1 origins can be traced back to Bletchley Park and the early code breaking successes there, as well as Bletchley's equivalent departments in the USA especially in the fight against the U-boat menace. There'll be, then we will see some of Seymour's designs from the 50s and the 60s, and how they grew more and more powerful, finally leading up to the Cray-1 in the 1970s, and what it was that made that machine form as well as it did. After a look at the architecture and the electronics, We'll see what the power and cooling requirements were and how the system was maintained. We'll also see who some of the users were and what they used it for. And finally, a brief look at some of the following follow on products. So what actually is a supercomputer? Uh, well, yeah, uh, there's lots of definitions from the past, um, technical ones. Um, supercomputer is, is one that costs over $10 million. Supercomputer that's only one generation behind what scientists actually need. And a, science, a computer that's faster than its contemporaries. I think nowadays, the definition is quite different. And uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a computer with many hundreds or thousands of processors all working together. So, history. I think by now we've, we've, uh, we've all heard of the exploits of the cryptanalysts and code breakers of Bletchley Park during World War II and how the German and Enigma and Lorenz ciphers were cracked. Well, it should come as no surprise that similar activities were taking place in the United States, especially targeting Japanese codes. The US Navy and Army both had sections working on code breaking but there was a lot of rivalry between them. Uh, in, in fact, there's there's one story I read that uh, that the the army was allowed to uh, work on code breaking on even days, and the navy was allowed to work on the odd days of the uh, of the calendar. Um, they both built their own machines to attack particular codes. They were very big and very expensive. One of the navy's prominent code breakers, William. Bill Norris, a former X-ray salesman at Westinghouse. Some biographies say he was a radio ham, but I've never been able to uh, confirm this. So let's take a brief look at some of the development of the hardware that was being produced to solve the code breaking problem during World War II and the Cold War that followed. 
Bletchley Park was keen to get help from the US during the war, not just for financial, oh, sorry, it was the British government who were keen to uh, get help from the US during the, during the war, not only financial and material, but also for code breaking assistance as well. Britain had not done too well on Japanese codes as, as they had on the, the, the Germans. And in 1940, German U-boats were attacking US shipping. A deal was arranged to swap details of the advances both sides had made, which included plans of the bomb machine at Bletchley was using on Enigma messages. The US Navy redesigned the bomb to work against the recently updated four rotor Enigma machine the German Navy was using. They also began to look at machines based on the Heath Robinson and Colossus design to attack other countries' codes. So in the, the, the slide here, we have uh, the, uh, the, the Bletchley Park machines, the bomb on the left there and, uh, and Colossus. And this is the American version of the bomb. Okay. Okay, the US version of the bomb was built by the National Cash Register Company, and the first two prototypes were called Adam and Eve. The US Army also built a bomb and called it Madam X. The Navy had NCR build 121 four rotor bombs, and the Army had 10 of their version built by Bell Labs. The Navy bomb could crack a three rotor Enigma cipher in 50 seconds and a four rotor in 20 minutes. The army machine could only attack three rotor enigmas. Um, the uh, Bletchley Park bomb could complete a three wheel run in 16 minutes, but by the spring of 1943, this had been reduced to one and a half minutes. After the war, the Navy um, set up a company to continue to produce code breaking machines. It was called ERA, Engineering Research Associates, based in St. Paul, Minnesota. And Bill Norris was to head it up. Uh, there's th this picture here is, uh, is, is some of the machines that they built. Th these were built to crack particular codes, just uh, single purpose machines. Warlock was designed to, uh, to, to solve the Hagelin C38 code and similar machines. Um, and it was, it was so large, it was said that uh, it had to be kept and operated at the factory. Uh, it, it's, it's also been said that the CIA persuaded the Swedes to sell the Hagelin machine to the Soviets once they'd figured out how to crack it. That might still be restricted, actually. <laughs> um, Goldberg was, uh, was, a, was a follow on. The, these machines were sort of just about computers, but they, uh, they, they didn't work like computers. Goldberg was the um, NSA's version of, uh, of Bletchley Park's Robinson machine, and it was the first machine to use a magnetic drum memory to hold data during processing. It was used to attack various teletypes. The um, Demon, there were two versions of that and the O'Malley, and there was also the Robin. The O'Malley was, uh, was, was a statistical machine used to uh, analyze encrypted text. text. And, uh, and it was also the first machine capable of um, multiply operations. Eventually, it was decided it would be more efficient to, um, to, to build a programmable computer that could be used against any code. Also, uh, uh, another little aside about Demon. Uh, Demon was, um, was up and running to crack a particular Soviet code in, uh, in sort of by about mid-1949. But in um, in, in later in 1949, the uh, the Soviets stopped using that code altogether. I often wonder if this was um, due to the uh, uh, due to the work of certain um, Cambridge-based spies. Right. Okay. So the result of their their first programmable computer was the Atlas One, built in 1950. Two of these machines were supplied to the NSA. Oh, by the by, this time, by the way, the, uh, the 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 departments of the Navy and the Army 
had been combined to form the National Security Agency. So there's a lot more efficiency there. Um, the Atlas had 1,700 valves, and it was used for about a decade, undergoing several updates. Um, this, th this machine should not be confused with another Atlas uh, built, by, built in the UK by Manchester University for Anti and Plessy in the early 1960s, um, one of which was delivered to the Rutherford Lab at Harworth. So it wasn't long before they started thinking about non-military applications for the machine. The Navy gave the go-ahead for the first commercial computer, the ERA-1101, announced in December 1951. It was based on the Atlas, and it was called the 1101 because that's binary for 13, and the development of the machine was called Task 13. Okay, however, um, cryptology machines were not the only product that uh, ERA made. And in fact, it wouldn't have kept them going if they'd only made those. One of their best sellers was actually an automatic antenna coupler for jet aircraft, uh, mainly sold to Boeing for their successful 707 airliner, as well as uh, many um, military aircraft. Also, the, the President's Air Force planes had six couplers plus spares on board. It's likely that uh, this product was one of the attractions for uh, Remington Rand to uh, buy out ERA in 1952, along with drum memory, um, since uh, no one at Remington had high enough security to know about the, uh, the secret project. Uh, Remington Rand had already bought out another company, computer company, Urquhart Morkley Computer Corporation, EMCC, who'd produced the Univac-1 computer and earlier machines for the US Army. EMCC had previously built the ENIAC computer, believed to be the first digital computer until we found out about Colossus. Um, note in the photo here, the, um, the guy standing behind the operator there, I think he, he must be the, uh, the, the, the computer engineer. And if you look to the left there, it looks very much like an old uh, Tektronix scope. And on the desk is what I can't help thinking is a heat kit valve voltmeter. Uh, if that's the case, I think they must have been getting desperate for test equipment. Okay, so with the two companies now merged under Remington Rand and the Univac name already known publicly, it was decided to rename the next generation Atlas II the Univac 1103 for the commercial market. The marketing promotional film featured the names of the engineers who'd worked on the machine and Seymour Cray was amongst them. Let me go down to... Okay, so... Seymour Cray was born in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin on the 28th of September, 1925. He was very interested in science as a child. And uh, again, some biographies say he was a radio ham too, but I've trawled through all the cool books from the era and I've never found his name listed. He apparently built a Morse oscillator and wired it up um, between his and his sister's bedroom so they could mess with each other after night, after the lights out at night. He was awarded the science prize at the local high school and joined the army in 1943 when he graduated. During World War II, he served as a radio operator in Europe and the Far East and may have been involved in signals intelligence. After the war, he enrolled in the University of Minnesota and gained a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a master's in mathematics in 1951. His first job was with ERA and very soon he was making a name for himself, suggesting various redesigns for the systems they were building. He completely re redesigned the control system for the Univac 1103. Pause there for a mouthful of tea. Right. Seymour had read up on transistors and went out and bought some, possibly from Radio Shack, the the shop they call, we call Tandy in the UK. He seems to have um, 
uh, uh, bought a, a batch of uh, germanium rejects, but he came up with a design that worked and he built the Univac M460. It was later re-engineered after Seymour left the company using silicon transistors and the chassis was stood upright, more like a fridge than a freezer. Each logic unit comprised two transistors, 11 diodes and eight resistors on a two inch by two and a half inch printed circuit board. Up to 400 printed circuit boards could be mounted in the chassis and there were nine chassis in the cabinet, as well as four core memory chassis. The design was simulated and tested on the 1103 computer. It would appear to be air cooled. It may not have been all transistor though. There's some suggestion that the power supply used valve rectifiers. Right. Okay. Right, so sixteen oh four. Yeah, I'm just uh, catching up here. Seymour's next project was to be a machine fifty times faster than the sixteen than the sixteen oh four. Sorry, we, it, I missed a page here. Um, the 1604 was the next computer after the 460, and uh, it's beginning of uh, of control data. Um, Seymour had, had had got a bit fed up with um, with ERA because of the uh, the, the, the the corporate um, um, way of, of operating. It, it wasn't it wasn't like what he was used to with with a small team just working on. Uh, on one machine at the time, just with his um, with, with his favourite engineers around him. So um, he uh, he and Norris they went they went across the across the river and um, they they set up a a, um, a a new company called Control Data. So after um, after the the sixteen oh four, we start. Um, uh, this is actually an old slide. I thought I'd replaced this slide, but uh, it seems to be an old one. Anyway, um, the, um, the the next machine was the uh, was was the CDC sixty six hundred, and this machine used four hundred thousand silicon planar transistors, and it was cooled by a Freon refrigeration system. It had a ten megahertz clock and parallel functional units. The processor cabinets were arranged in a cross to, uh, to minimize wire length. And with a well-tuned assembler, it could reach one megaflop per second and was called a supercomputer. In 1964, it sold for $8 million and 400 were installed. So now we have to talk, start talking about megaflops. A flop is a floating point operation per second. <clears throat> Floating point is the way in which large numbers are represented in computer logic. Uh, it's really similar to what we know as scientific notation. A number with one digit to the left of the point and an exponent to show how far to move the point. A floating point operation could be equivalent to adding, subtracting or multiplying two decimal numbers with up to 15 digits each. And a megaflop, of course, is a million of these operations per second. The 6600 could perform up to three megaflops. The, uh, the next machine was the 7600. This was also free on cooled and ran at 36 megahertz clock. It used a core memory length, it used core memory and a word length of 60 bits. It was not software compatible with the 6600 and it wasn't very reliable. However, the, the C-shaped structure designed to keep wire length short also made it easier for the engineers to replace faulty modules. There were about 75 7600s sold. Um, there was some installed in the UK and there is, or there was, one in the London Science Museum. The picture in the centre there is the 8600. That was the last project that Cray had from control data. It was intended to be 10 times faster than the 7600, and it's basically four 7600s 
packed into a small chassis. However, they were insolvable cooling problems and the company felt they were spending too much money on the project. It was to be a 64-bit machine as well. Uh, the only solution, it seemed, was for Seymour to leave CDC and start his own company, which he did in 1972. Cray had a building constructed on the same land as the control data facility and his own home. The result was the Cray One. It was finally ready by 1975. Not only was the performance better than any other machine available, its appearance was stunning. Customers could even choose the colors of the side panel and the leatherette seating. And so there's a bit of specification here. It's a 64-bit machine with a 80 megahertz clock. It used 200,000 ICs. They weren't very big ICs. We'll talk about that in a minute. 67 miles of wire. It could do 160 megaflops um, using 115 kilowatts of power. Again, this was free on cool. It weighed five and a quarter tons. And the price it started at about $8 million. This picture is actually the, uh, the Serial One. And it's uh, when it was at, uh, at, at Harwell. Serial One is a little bit shorter. Than, uh, than than subsequent method than some subsequent models, and uh, we'll we'll see why in a minute. So it consisted of twelve columns. Um, it was so I think we got some dimensions here. Yeah, some dimensions here. So the Cray one was um, yeah it was it was uh, twelve columns, about six feet high and five feet in, in diameter. At the base, the seats extended thirty inches by nineteen inches. And uh, they're, they're actually cabinets containing the power supplies and refrigeration controls. And uh, yeah, as I said before, that, um, that serial one is actually about six inches shorter than other machines, which we'll uh, come on to. Let's uh, go down to the next bit. So this, this actually is a page from the, um, uh, from, from the, 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 the re reference manual. Each column, contained two chassis, one on top of the other, with space for, six, for 72 modules. In total, the, 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 the um, computer contained 1,662 modules of 113 different types. Uh, the modules consisted of two printed circuit boards mounted back to back on a copper plate, which was used as a heat sink. Each module could contain up to 288 flat pack 16 pin ICs. There were only three types of integrated circuit used throughout the machine. There was uh, a, a five and four input NAND gate. So that, that's two gates on a chip, uh, which perform the logic functions. A 16 by one bit register chip for the functional units and, uh, and a 100, 1024 by one bit bipolar memory chip. Uh, each printed circuit board is five layer, two layers for signal runs, one each for the uh, minus 5.2 and minus 2 volt supplies. Much work uh, went into reducing standing waves on the PCBs. The length of the tracks used uh, ensured all signals are 50 to 60 ohms impedance transmission lines. Construction is uh, plated through holes. The little black blobs are resistors. You can see the little black bulbs. You can zoom in there. Um, they were awfully small and they got lost instantly. Um, and uh, they were used to terminate the, uh, the ECL gate outputs and inputs to minus two volts. To control the uh, operation of, um, of, of the early machines, uh, the bottom right there is a control data eclipse mini computer. These were supplied with uh, with the, um, in fact, there were there were two of them: one for the operators and one for the engineers to uh, to use as a maintenance console. Uh, later machines, though, uh, in, incorporated uh, the um, input-output technology into the the, the uh, mainframe itself. There was also uh, available a solid-state disk, um, which uh, which gave very fast storage, and again, that was built into a separate four-column unit. Right. 
So what made it fast? Well, there are several design features that are seen in Seymour's previous machine, but it's the first time for integrated circuits. The clock frequency was 80 megahertz, the 12.5 nanosecond pulse. Uh, multiple functional units allow parallel execution of instructions, so you could do multiplies and adds at the same time. The vector registers, that, that's a way of um, processing multiple data with a single instruction. It could be pipelined so that the result of one instruction could be fed back into the next instruction directly without having to go back into memory. It was also um, reduced instruction set, which is a uh, uh, risk as, um, as, as modern computers are now. And um, it also used a, a fast, at the time anyway, a fast semiconductor memory with a 50 nanosecond cycle time. So, there we go. Let's go down. So ECL logic, the, the, the chips on there are, were ECL NAND gates, and they each contain two gates with, uh, with one with four inputs and one with five inputs. It's a very low standard of scale of integration by today's standards. But Seymour Cray would only use tried and tested technology, and that was the best you could get at the time, the fastest anyway. ECL is considered to be, or was, probably is still considered to be very high speed. The, um, the voltage swing between zero and one levels was, was very small. Um, and the transistors never became saturated. Uh, the, the implementation used by uh, Cray also used a negative supply rail, which uh, benefited from better noise immunity. So the, uh, there we go. It was also the, 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 the C shape of the mainframe also kept, um, uh, kept the wire length short. Each module socket had 96 pins connected to an 18 inch length of PTFE coated wire twisted uh, together. The, the wires were connected by means of solder sleeves and the, uh, the minimum delay on the wire was, um, was three nanoseconds. I hope you don't mind me using uh, the old imperial measurements, but that's what we used in, mm. in, in Chippewa. And it would have got disastrous if we tried um, uh, converting them to, uh, to metric and uh, we would probably drill the holes in the wrong place for the uh, for the floor. Okay, so this um, this this actually this picture here is actually a bit of serial number two, which was scrapped, um, but it was used for training purposes. And you can see the uh, the, the module sitting in there, and um, the, the 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 wires hanging out the back of it. Um, I think the next picture is. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this this is the actual back plane. This is where the 67 miles of wire come into it. Um, very occasionally, you get a fault. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the wires, the two 18 inch lengths of wire were joined together with solder sleeves, um, which were heated with a, with a hot air gun to, uh, to melt the solder in the middle. Occasionally in the factory, um, one of them wouldn't melt properly and you'd get an intermittent, you get a dry joint basically. Um, trying to find it in that was um, was was a fairly big task actually. Uh, okay, so um, so this is uh, this is a few slides now of the actual um, how uh, how the, uh, the, the the actual system worked internally. So you've got uh, the, the registers, the functional units, all the computing stuff quite separate on one side of the memory and all the slow input output um, channels coming in at the bottom. The, um, you didn't connect your, uh, your, your uh, uh, monitor or your teletype or whatever straight into the array. You, you went through another computer, a front end computer. Um, they, they, they catered for several different uh, models. You could have um, IBM or fax uh, CDC um, in fact anything you wanted uh, they, they would build a box to uh, to accommodate you so this, this is a, a diagram of, of how everything works inside so you can see the the memory there I don't know if you can see the pointer but um, um, the vector registers where the sort of data will be kept and, and the 
the functional units that did the actual uh, the actual processing. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a pretty neat layout actually, and um, worked very well. So let's see where are we? Okay, so that's um, yeah. Now all these um, all these these ECL chips. Um, they, they, they were a bit like a class A amplifier. The transistors never switched off or went into saturation. Therefore, as I said previously, they, they switch very quickly between uh, a small voltage range. Um, this gives speed, but it uses a lot of power. The average power dissipation of a Cray-1 module was around 50 watts. The total power requirement was 115 watts. The power system, um, comprised usually of two 150 kilowatt, 400 hertz motor generators. These supplied 208 volts AC to a bank of 20 variacs in a separate power distribution unit cabinets. Uh, these in turn fed 20 minus two, 5.2 volt and 16 minus two volt, 12 phase rectifiers under the seats of the mainframe. These, uh, these supplies were divided into groups of three, and each group supplied one column. They had a choke filter to smooth the DC and a freon cold plate to cool it. The, the PDU, the, the power distribution cabinet, also contained monitoring and control circuitry. So just to refresh your memory, which I'm sure you, uh, you know all about, 12-phase rectifiers, um, that's, uh, that, that, that's a, a simplified diagram of what it looked like very simple circuitry. But that's what it actually looked like under those seats. And th this is one of the reasons why you rarely saw engineers sitting down on the, on the Cray seats, because they knew what was underneath. The, the only people who sat on it were, were customers and salespeople. But um, those, um, those, those power supplies were each capable of delivering a thousand amps. So um, it was, uh, it, 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 it was uh, pretty hectic stuff down there. If you're used to, um, you know, laptops and things. So that this is actually um, this this is actually a Cray two power supply, but it uses exactly the same technology, only it's it's miniaturized, and you can see the uh, the the, um, um, the the two separate um, the star and the delta windings, and the green things in the middle are are, um, are, are iron dust cores with uh, wound with chokes. And you can see along the top there were six diodes on the, on the top, six diodes on the bottom, and and uh, it, the, the Cray two did actually use capacitors, but um, I don't think the um, the Cray one had uh, had smoothing capacitors with um, a twelve phases and four hundred hertz. It was uh, there, there wasn't wasn't a great deal of ripple. So this thing got very hot, and. The, um, the the engineer who was uh, kind of the, the um, Seymour Cray's uh, 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 refrigeration man who who'd come with him through uh, through several other companies, um, Dean Rausch, um, he he uh, he he was a real fan of refrigerant R22 Freon, and um, he came up with a solution to uh, cool the Cray, and it was it was two by twenty ton capacity compressors. Which was later re, um, reduced to one fifty-ton compressor, is shown in the picture there. When they talk about compressors, the fifty-ton means it's equivalent to fifty tons of ice, not the actual weight of the thing, although it's probably pretty close. Um, and this supplied Freon through stainless steel tubes embedded in aluminium coal bars, um, running up the, the sides of each column. Uh, this this is one of the few uh, patents that Cray actually had was this uh, cooling system. Uh, the chips themselves attained a temperature of between 48 and 54 degrees, depending on the um, on their position in the module. The copper cold plate reached a temperature of 25 degrees when it was clamped to the cold bar, and the cold bar was set to 21 degrees. Um, I have converted these to Celsius, by the way. Um, and the power supplies were also cooled, as I mentioned before. The, all the temperature controls were under the seats. So maintenance. 
The um, Cray-1, Serial-1, the first machine to be installed in this country at Harwell was six inches shorter than Serial-3 onwards, and I mentioned before. Now, the reason for this was something that Seymour and not many other people had anticipated, and it was that the chips were actually prone to cosmic ray collisions. In fact, it wasn't known that these high, high speed particles from beyond the solar system could have an effect on electronics on, on the ground. It, they knew they could uh, knock out satellite electronics, but um, this was the first time that, um, that uh, these, um, what they called single event upsets were actually detected on Earth. And it was that the, um, uh, when the, uh, when Cray-1 Serial-1 was undergoing trials, at the Los Alamos Laboratory, um, you, which you'll know if you've seen the Oppenheimer film, um, that this, this uh, phenomenon was discovered. Extra circuitry was, um, was, was uh, invented, to, um, uh, which, which made the, the machine a bit taller. This extra circuitry was called SECGED, standing for single bit correction, double bit detection. And uh, it, was, um, it, was, it was to um, uh, 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 correct the, the problem they were having with um, with memory errors. Serial number one never got modified and it, uh, it still went around the, um, went around the, well, around the world um, into uh, what they used to do. They used to uh, put serial one into, uh, into a customer site so that they could get used to the idea of having a cray and, uh, and, and convert their software onto it until their, the machine that they purchased was delivered and then it'd be moved on to, uh, to another site. Um, yeah, Serial 2 had already been started production, but it was scrapped. Uh, we've seen that some of those parts were used for training. So apart from memory errors, other component failures could occur with the Cray-1. Um, and uh, as the, the, the Cray was a very large investment by the customer, an engineer or two were uh, usually included in the deal. The engineers were supplied with enough spare parts, um, specialized tools and documentations to um, to, to diagnose and, and repair just about anything that could go wrong in the field. There was a great deal of diagnostic software available for both online and offline fault finding as well. However, occasionally a problem would show up in a user program and the engineer would have to try and track down the exact code causing the problem. Once the suspect module was determined, it could be swapped out with a spare. And if the fault cleared, the module would be placed in a tester and it would, um, it would be run completely using the, the failing code sequence entered on switches in early systems, or uh, as the one on the left up there in the picture, or via a mini computer on, uh, on later systems. The uh, logic uh, documentation for the Cray consisted of long lists of Boolean equations, not circuit diagrams, but it was actually, once you got used to it, it was really easy to follow and uh, and diagnose a faulty component with a fast oscilloscope. An anti-static uh, repair facility was uh, was also provided. And uh, let's go down to the next picture. Yeah, so here's the um, the repair facility, and um, it was supplied with uh, microscope and fine soldering iron, a foot-operated solder sucker, which I think is a great idea. And I wish that uh, I wish I kept mine. And um, 40 components would be sent back to the factory in Chippewa for analysis in case a bad batch code was identified. All the, all the, all the tools, um, all the powered tools anyway, required 120 volt, 60 hertz supply. So in, uh, in, in European sites, we had to uh, install an extra generator for that. Um, occasionally when uh, replacing a module, a slightly displaced pin would damage the connector at the back of the column. This would require some extremely delicate surgery involving replacing the wire and reforming the connector with epoxy resin. Even rarer were production faults when a, a, a connector in the back plane had not been soldered, leading to an intermittent fault which uh, could take months to find. Power supply problems were rare, but cooling system needed constant attention. The compressor was extremely noisy and messy, as lubricating oil seemed to seep out everywhere. The controls were unreliable and it could shut down for no apparent reason. The heat exchanger used chilled water supplied by the customer. 
And if some local maintenance person decided to shut the chilled water off to fix a leak or change a filter, then the whole computer system would shut down. Right. Um, yeah, each each um, each computer, each customer um, had to provide a room for the engineer and uh, and the various pieces of equipment and documentation to supply the system. Sometimes the room was set aside for uh, for an analyst as well who could help with uh, operating system and user problems as well. So we saw the uh, the tools and things there. So this this is the the, the um, software supplied. The operating system, um, Seymour really didn't like operating systems and he didn't think it was necessary. And he said if the users wanted one, they could get their own. Um, but uh, but others disagreed and they did supply a, a very basic batch operating system, which they called COS. Others um, used a, a CT, CTSS, which was a sort of time sharing system, um, which, uh, which was one of the major customers had written but was used by quite a lot of other customers as well. Later on, the Unix operating system was developed for the Cray 2, but uh, but not uh, ported to the Cray 1. Um, NSA and GCHQ used an operating system called Folklore. And uh, the, the um, <clears throat> um, programming languages supplied was, was, was an, it was an assembly language and Cray Fortran. To begin with, but uh, other languages um, became available later on. So there's, there's a list of some of the um, some of the applications there, uh, and, and, and I know I've, I've seen a seen a book of the um, sort of an application directory, and I did find in it there was an antenna design um, application, but uh, I, I never got around to running it. <laughs> Would have been interesting. Right. Okay, so who was using it? Well, this is a this is a list of um, of, of the users who used the Cray One um, in this country, and see, there's 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 kind of various um, ECMWF is the uh, European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, uh, which is based in uh, based in Reading. RE Farnborough. Uh, I'm not that far away. You've probably all heard of what they did. The Daresby Lab is a, is a, a science research place. UK Atomic Energy Authority, Harwell Lab, uh, very one of the first uh, users. Uh, Shell um, up in um, uh, up in the north of England were were doing um, um, geophysical uh, prospecting and things. University of London had um, uh, had a, a Cray one. They also had uh, the CDC 7600 next to it. MOD had a couple of machines, um, and um, uh, GCO was also a, uh, a, a an oil company which um, did prospecting out in the uh, out in the desert and sent tapes full of sand back to um, uh, to be analysed. Interestingly, their um, their computer was not far away from here either. It was uh, it was in Woking, and it was in an office just over the um, over the top of the Argos shop. Um, there's the kind of thing that you didn't really want to know about if you were shopping in Argos regularly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, that's the uh, that that was the the, the 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 customers here. So what happened after after the Cray one? There was several. I don't know if, if this is going to come up very well, but. Uh, Seymour um, went off to design the Cray 2, and that uh, that that that's produced. They they produced about 30, I think, model of Cray 2. Um, we had two in this country, one at uh, Harwell and one at um, at Farnborough. Um, several dotted around Europe. Uh, in, in 1985, um, I I, be, I went over to I, I became a Cray 2 specialist, and um, and I travelled a fair bit around the world. Um, fixing those things. The interesting thing about them is that they used immersion cooling. The whole thing was like a, a big fish tank full of um, something called fluorinert. Um, but um, 
Seymour Cray went on to uh, to, to design um, his, his, his Cray 3, but uh, he was running out of money. And once again, he uh, he up sticks and, and went down to Colorado to, uh, uh, to to run a whole new company down there. Um, the Cray 3, I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately, but um, it was it was very uh, advanced. It was to use gallium arsenide technology. One of them was built, but uh, it didn't work very well. Um, there was also a, a Cray 4 on the drawing board, but in, in 1996, Seymour was killed in a car accident. Um, other, other engineers developed the, um, the, the, the uh, Cray 1 into the Cray XMP, which was a, a two or four processor um, Cray 1, really, um, in, in the same um, mainframe. Uh, they just use they just use more integ you know, bigger integrated chips that became very successful and 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 that was developed into uh, into several machines however the uh here we go this is this was a sort of landmark machine the the sv2 um the sv2 was the, the beginning of the kind of uh, machines nowadays you you, uh, you you call supercomputers Dozens and dozens of cabinets. These machines were massively parallel. They had uh, they had hundreds, um, if not thousands, of, uh, of processors, and they also they, they could also do vectors as well. One of the interesting things about the uh, the, the, the SV2 project was that it was actually funded by the NSA. So uh, going back to um, Cray was going back to its roots again there. Um, Cray was taken over by Silicon Graphics for a while, and then uh, then went off on its own. And they they developed this this product into um, in into machine called the X1. And the EX1 became the uh, the, the the current model, if you like. This this is the current uh, Cray system. It used up to um, 512 processors per cabinet. I'm not exactly sure how many this one used, but uh, as you can see there, it, uh, it, it went beyond gigaflops and megaflops and, and teraflops. This was 1.1 exaflops. This six billion times faster than the Cray one. And uh, that's the kind of machine which, um, which they're now shipping and the, uh, the, the the price has gone up accordingly, I would imagine. Okay, so that's that's the story of the Cray One and its follow-ons and uh, and how it began. Um, thank you for your attention. Mm. Silent applause as everybody has their microphones off. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, thank you very much indeed, Ken. That's very interesting. Oh, oh, I seem thank to remember uh, around about I think it was late sixties. Sorry, Tom. Around about late sixties. Oh, I can stop sharing. Yeah. Sorry, did you say something, Tom? I didn't. We didn't catch it. Sorry. I remember right. I think it was the late 60s, maybe the early 40s, when they started selling off all the gold contacts, and you used to be able to buy a whole board for two shillings or something like that from from what's radio at Kingston. I don't know, mm. but that, that, would that have been in the late 60s? Right. Um, sorry, I'm just going to see if I can... Uh improve the audio at this end. Um oh yeah it's gonna go somewhere. Make your laptop audio try. Try that one. I'll try that. that doesn't, doesn't go ahead. Uh yeah I think what Tom was asking there, your 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 signal is breaking up a bit there, Tom. Um I think uh, what you're asking there was about um uh <coughs> selling off computer boards in the was it the sixties or on the old ones with uh, with gold plated contacts in them. Yeah, there, there was a fair bit of yes. gold in the uh, in the Cray module, actually. Hang on. I think I think we've I think we've lost lost.
Tom's link there. I think okay. your 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 uh, Wi-Fi is a bit iffy, Tom. He's on his halo. Yeah. All right, be back in a moment. I think he's gone gone to find a sample. <clears throat> no, I haven't. I'm, I'm still here, Phil. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I can hear you, uh, 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 Tom. But you're 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 coming and going. Your signal is coming and going, as is your video. But um, I think um, oh, okay. Ken's just gone upstairs to to find something he wants oh, to uh, to show us. So uh, he'll, be, he'll be back in a sec. Well, uh, when when uh, Ken comes back, I have a comment for him. He's coming out, right? Okay, now hang on. Uh, hang on, just a, just a sec. I think this is to do with the previous uh, question. He's brought a Cray uh, computer with him. There we go. That that that's a that's a Cray one module. Oh wow! Get a bit more light on it, isn't it? Yeah, that's brilliant. It's uh, it's heavy. I can tell you, it's heavy. Uh, yes. You can tell that the core of it is uh, copper, two, three millimeter thick copper, something oh. like that, and covered in these beautiful little uh, chips, which are um, presumably predate or around the same time as the uh, the standard dual in line uh, chips that uh, we see nowadays, but almost on the almost on the way to um, uh, to the surface mount devices um, that that we that we as radio amateurs all know and hate. Um, but it, I, I can honestly say it's beautifully made, absolutely beautiful. Sometimes we had to um, we had to perform modifications where uh, we had to wrap. An incredibly thin piece of wire around one of the pins and take it on a particularly circuitous route to another pin um, on another chip somewhere. You also see those little um, those little the little black dots there. They're re the resistors. <coughs> that's, oh, a, yes, that's, these... a, that's a package with two 60 ohm resistors in it. All right, I don't, I don't know if we if we can actually see these. Maybe I need to get my torch out. Um, Wow. You can just see a few little black dots by the... Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's what I've highlighted there, the little little dots that are standing up there. Yeah. When when you get those from the factory, the, the, the wires are, are out straight, and um, in the process of bending them to fit in the holes, they usually used to spring off the pliers and disappear. <laughs> So you need to get a whole box of them just to change one. Unbelievable. Incredible. Uh, Neil, I think you had a... Yeah, I just had a comment for Ken. Uh, going back in history, you mentioned ENIAC, the, the machine. Well, the E in ENIAC stood for Eckert, one of the... Uh, builders of that machine. The interesting thing is the son of, uh, I forget his first name now, Mr. Oh, Edenac, yeah. uh lives here in Atlanta. And Christopher Eckert and I worked together. And uh, the Eckert of Eniac was his father. All right. Oh, that's a claim to fame. Yeah, small world. That, that really is a claim to fame, isn't it? <laughs> Any more questions? No, nope. don't be shy. Are you Norman. me, Philip? Go ahead, Norman. No, nope, thank you. Can, oh, can you just... hear me, Phil? Uh, yes, Tom. Can you can you stop for a moment, Tom? You're, you're interrupting Norman. Hang on. A few years ago, I was. The, uh, to the European weather station that Ken mentioned in Reading 
uh, because of obviously my interest in the um, in the uh, of, of, um, the ionosphere, where they were carrying on intensive studies on the ionosphere and its effect on weather for some reason. But in the course of the the visit there, the the guide that was leading us around um, the centre. Uh, it was. It, I had the impression it was his party piece on the tour. He asked me if I could hand him a small container about the size of a, a small pail, a small garden pot with a handle. And he asked me if I could hand it. He said, could you pass me that, please, Norman? And when I went to pick it up, it, it defied... It defied my senses, it defied the eye. It was as if it was glued to the floor. And it was later explained that that was heavy water. And, but I, I was, we knew there was a Cray computer there. Uh, you didn't mention heavy water. And I wondered what was the science and what was the effect of heavy water and why was that so difficult to lift? Well, for one thing, I very much doubt if it was heavy water. Um, heavy water is deuterium, isn't it? Yeah, deuterium yes. oxide. De deuterium, so. yes, which is a uh, 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 used in the nuclear industry. No, what I think it was that um, that he gave you to to lift up was a canister of the uh, fluorinert cooling liquid, which um, which is used in the later Cray models. Um, as, as a coolant, and it it is um, yeah it it is a lot heavier than water. It, it's uh, it's an interesting kind of liquid. It's made by three M's, um, and um, it's it, it it it's sort of derived from the plasma that's used in um, in the sort of uh, um, military medical centres to to keep the the blood vessels open. Um, after after injury, it's uh, yeah, it, it is a remarkable fluid. It's it's um, it's very good at, at transferring heat until it gets two hundred degrees, in which case it breaks down and it becomes very dangerous. Um, what I thought you were going to say about uh, ECMWF was that um, it was that was one of the places where they um, discovered the hole in the iron the hole in the ozone layer over the Antarctic. And um, I remember they had several um, pictures, you know, computer generated pictures up of the, um, of the hole in the, the ozone layer. And it was later discovered that, uh, that, that one, of the, one of the chemicals which causes this is the actual coolant for the Cray-1. Really? Go yes. <laughs> The Freon. The Freon, Freon. yes. Sorry, I, I missed here in Oz. You said that the you thought that the bucket was silence. Your word dropped out. What did you think that bucket or pot of uh, liquid was? It's 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 called fluorinert. It's ah yeah. Um, it, it, it's it's oh. got several use. I'll tell you what. One place, a common place where it's used, is using flow soldering. And where uh, vapor phase, sorry, vapor phase flow so of soldering something. Yes, I think that's that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there's there's several several other companies. I believe Cray use um. Yes, that Cray use uh, that, that's something similar. Uh, uh, vapor phase um, cooling system now on their on their new machines. I'm not exactly sure how it works. I've been been out of touch, but uh, um, yeah, that. So that I, I would I would say that the the, um, the 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 substance that you were told to live was was not heavy water. No, it wouldn't be significantly heavier than regular water. I wouldn't think so. No, no it wouldn't. No. Um, am I right in thinking, Ken, that the uh, the Met Office used a rival computing product? Yes, you're right. They did. <laughs> Um, up until 1967, sorry, 1987, um, the, uh, the, the, the Met Office used a CDC computer, 
I believe it was called the star system, I think. I, I can't remember exactly. Um, yeah, so, and, and in fact, Cray at the time in the UK was based in Bracknell, almost opposite the, uh, the, the Met Office. But it was only the, uh, the, the, the hurricane of 1987 Mm -hmm. um, that uh, when, when we all know poor old uh, Mr. Fish went on television and said there wasn't going to be a hurricane and yeah. uh, the, the next day the country was in a mess. Uh, it, was, it was after that that, um, and I, I think it was Maggie Thatcher herself who, uh, who, who demanded that um, extra money be given to the Met Office to buy a decent computer. And um, they, they, uh, they went to their current supplier and said, can you, um, you, know, can, can you provide a, a machine which will outperform the one that we've already got? And they said, yes, we can. And, um, and and they they went and uh, they they delivered a machine, but they could never get it working properly. And so that the, the, the contract with them was that they were to provide a computer which could do this job. Um, and in the end, Control Data had to go to Cray and buy two Cray XMPs, which were installed instead. So our competitor had to buy um, Cray machines to install at the the Met Office, and because they were Cray machines, guess what the Met Office called them? Ronnie and Reggie. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, and uh, ever ever since then, the Met Office has been a Cray customer. Uh, they've now moved down to Exeter, and uh, and and they've got a huge, great system down there now. Any more questions? I would like to thank 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 you for the thank you Ken for the um, presentation. It was really interesting, and I'm so glad you're recording it. Here, here.